Okay, so hemoglobin, what is it and how is it used and what are the regular questions that come up on this? Well, my definition for hemoglobin is not really a definition. It's going to be a protein with a quaternary structure. The reason I'm going to write that is because that tends to be the question that they ask about hemoglobin. So what actually is it? I can be a bit more useful now that you've got the mark. You've, it's basically found in red blood cells and it transports oxygen around the body. It does this in a reversible reaction. So I'm going to change card to make it stand out. We've got hemoglobin, and that is going to combine with oxygen. Generally speaking, it's going to be in the lungs, and in a reversible reaction, we're then going to form oxyhemoglobin. Obviously, this needs to be re reversible. In the lungs, we need this to happen, but in the respiring tissues, we need oxyhemoglobin to be broken down into so we can release the oxygen, which can be then used for respiration. So we're now going to divide the page into two halves. This half, the first half, is going to be the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. It's a bit of a mouthful. It's not too bad. OK, I'm going to draw a graph for this. This is always going to be represented on a graph, and it's very commonly asked. We've got our axes. What, are, what do we need to label these? Well, this is the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen, so how much oxygen has the hemoglobin got. So this will be 100% saturation, and this will be 0% saturation, empty. And on this axis is the partial pressure of O2, which is a little bit like concentration of a liquid, how, how concentrated, how much oxygen is around. And the, a very commonly used abbreviation is little p, little p, O2, partial pressure. Okay, well, we know that the, more part, the higher the partial pressure, the higher the saturation, and the lower the partial pressure, or zero partial pressure of oxygen, means there's going to be no saturation. So we're expecting a vaguely positive correlation, but it's not a straight line. Up here, we're fully saturated. Can't have any more oxygen in it. Hemoglobin is full. As we make our way down here, though, as I said, it's not a directly proportional positive correlation. We have an, an S-bend, something like this. And so we're going to look at now how oxygen and the terminology we need to use to, to comment on these graphs. Well, first of all, we've got hemoglobin fully saturated. I'm just going to do heme for hemoglobin, and this is going to be in the lungs, where there's a high partial pressure of oxygen. So maybe I'll choose a different color for So with high saturation in the lungs. Obviously, as we move towards the tissues, the amount of oxygen in the, in the surrounding tissues and the tissue fluid is going to decrease. So we're going to start sliding down this graph, which means more of the hemoglobin is going to release, is going to go this way and release the oxygen. So the tissues, it's not actually anywhere near zero. Obviously, if we had zero oxygen, that tissue is going to die. So we're going to be somewhere in this middle vicinity. So the, that tells us actually the hemoglobin returning to the lungs in the veins is actually still got maybe 30, 40, 50% oxygen still in it, which is quite surprising. This is gonna be our tissues. And this is gonna be our lungs. We need to use a very specific vocabulary when we're talking about this in the exam to get the marks. So this is going to be the words that we need to use to, to describe this graph. We're going to say oxygen loads, and loads is a key term, onto hemoglobin at a high partial pressure of O2. We can then say, as a result of this, hemoglobin becomes saturated with O2, with oxygen. Next point, oxygen unloads at the cells where the partial pressure of oxygen is low. You can say at the cells, you could say at the tissues, here I'm going to put PP and I'll put partial pressure in brackets. So these words are very important. If you don't use these words, it's going to be very difficult to get full marks on the exam, which is a shame, but now that you know that, you're going to be fine. This half of the diagram, or this half of the page, we are going to look at what's something known as the Bohr effect or the Bohr shift, which is a mechanism that basically means that you release more oxygen when you're actively respiring. Okay, so, shift, sometimes called the Bohr effect, and it's got an R on the end. And I'm going to spell it like this, because it shifts to the right. This whole graph shifts to the right, and I'm going to explain why. Our axes are the same. 
So we, I'm going to draw the blue line, the one that we had before, assuming I can replicate it fairly well. Something like that. Pretty difficult to draw these consistently. Do try and keep it consistent if you can. Well, obviously, at a high enough partial pressure, it's still going to be saturated. But the whole thing is effectively going to move to the right-hand side. So I'm trying to mirror it, and I'm going to try and come in like that. My axes are the same. There's no need to draw them out again. At the lungs, it's still going to be saturated. So that hasn't changed. It doesn't shift so much that it's not fully saturated at the lungs. But if we draw a line for the tissues, probably not the most realistic, but it demonstrates the point quite nicely. For the same drop in partial pressure at the tissues, we actually means the hemoglobin is less saturated with oxygen when it leaves, which means it's, it's done more of this. It's released more oxygen and there's less oxyhemoglobin. So I'm going to put this in the context of respiration. Uh, so when an organism is respiring a lot, there's an increase in the amount of carbon dioxide because it's respiring more. And this increases the blood acidity. It breaks down into carbonic acid, which basically makes the blood more acidic. You don't need to know the mechanism. Okay, so basically, if you've got more CO2, the blood becomes more acidic. And that decreases hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is how much it wants to combine with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. So the more, the higher hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen, the more it will grab oxygen and form oxyhemoglobin. And so if hemoglobin has less affinity for oxygen, it means that oxygen unloads more easily at respiring cells. And something that's commonly confused is that the hemoglobin here is less saturated. And that means it's less saturated with oxygen because it's released more oxygen at the muscles. Okay, so this shift from the blue line to the red line is called the Bohr shift. And I've written that with a red R because we know it shifts to the right. One thing to be careful of here, this is taking place within one organism. This is the change from an organism at rest to maybe an, one that's sprinting or running hard. It's respiring more, and so the blood, there's more carbon dioxide, which makes the blood more acidic. The increase in acidity reduces hemoglobin's grip on the oxygen, and we call this the affinity for oxygen. And that means that it can unload from the hemoglobin more easily at the respiring cells, which releases more oxygen so that it can respire more. So it's all very useful in that respect. I'll just mark on here our tissues, and again we have lungs. PPO2, I'll put percentage saturation. Heme. 